So hello and welcome to the Mindful Athlete interview with Thomas Broish. My name is Stephanie Gill and I help sporting leaders master their emotional state so they can, can become um, inspiring leaders for themselves and other people um, while still being themselves, which is really important. And there aren't too many people as true to themselves as our guest tonight, former Brisbane Raw football favourite Thomas Broish. And so... It was Ant Postacoglu, I believe, that stole Thomas away from his home country of Germany um, and the prestigious um, Bundesliga competition in 2010. And here he stayed in Brisbane for seven years. And he's considered uh, by many to be one of the best players to ever have played in Australia's A-League competition. He was part of three premiership winning teams here and two-time recipient of the Johnny Warren Medal, um, awarded to the best player in the A-League. And he's really just a very, very good egg. Um, amongst other things. So welcome, Thomas. Hello. <laughs> so um, thanks for coming along and sharing a bit about your approach to sport and life with us tonight. You're, uh, yeah, it's good to see you again. All the way from um, Barcelona, is it? Barcelona at the moment. Yeah, a bit of a gypsy these days. Yeah, getting around. It's um, good to be able to choose, pick and choose where you get to go yourself, isn't it? Yeah, it's very different. For the first time in my life, I'm actually in charge. I usually have to follow a very strict schedule. You know, even off seasons were never really off. You know, we always had to, to be somewhere and make sure that we're ticking over and stuff. And for the first time, there's nothing that I have to do. It's what I want to do, which is quite a nice feeling. Yeah, it sounds like you're really embracing it. A lot of athletes really struggle with the um, lack of... Um, structured routine and put it enforced by someone else you know so it's good to see that you're um, really loving that and embracing it you know it's funny that you mentioned that because every time I speak to former players they all tell me about you know missing the routine or even just uh, missing the excitement like the the adrenaline kicking in on a weekend and all of those things I'm not missing one bit like I'm super happy to be in charge of my own life I actually like it a bit more quiet as well. Like it's nice to be competitive and play in front of, I don't know, 10, 20, 30,000 people, but it's also a lot of pressure. And for the first time, I don't have to perform anymore. You know, to a certain extent with the TV show that we're doing, um, yeah, there's still an element of that, but it's nowhere near as competitive as it used to be. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how every, every person responds differently, each athlete responds differently to that transition period. And I suspect, Thomas, that a lot of the reason that you've transitioned so easily is because of some of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. That is my suspicion, but I'd like to get them confirmed by you, and we will do that as we uh, go along. And as you know, you've started to allude to, you really do have your own way and rhythm of doing things, so you're definitely known for walking um, to the beat of your own drum. And, and from knowing you, I would describe your rhythm as something as um, more flowing and steady and steady, easy as she goes, you know, going with the flow. But I'm not sure it's all, if it's always felt that way to you. So what I'd like to start with in this um, starting point of the interview is really if you can share what was happening in your life before you made a decision to I guess it's have more of an internal focus on your inner world and incorporate some of these practices such as meditation into your life. Tell, can you share with us what was going on back then or have you come out of the womb meditating? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, nah, not like that. Quite <laughs> the opposite, actually. Um, you know, growing up in a Western society, um, you're not necessarily exposed to those ideas straight away. And for the majority of my life or my career, um, I've been trying to deal with whatever comes my way, um, the Western way. And uh, it was um, not until I turned, I think, 29, 30. Um, actually, it happened when, when I was in Australia already that uh, I came across a few um, books, I'd say, and then obviously the work that we've been doing together in terms of... Uh, seminars and just life coaching in general that really um, changed my worldview and uh, gave me tools to deal with uh, a lot of things differently. So when was it? 29. How many years ago? How old are you now? 37. 
37. So it was really when you sort of launched on the, the shores of Australia. And if that's the case then, was there, um, was there something, a particular turning point or a significant event or something specific that can you remember that you just went, hang on, there's another way to, to do this? What, was there a realisation in there somewhere? Yeah, big time. Um, a friend of mine, he came to Australia and spent a few weeks with his family at my place and we were watching a lot of movies and in one of those movies, Eckhart Tolle featured. And um, I was quite drawn to his ideas and uh, I bought his book and that was a complete life and game changer for me. Like he was talking about um, the ego, how to, you know, yeah. basically, you know, not get rid of your ego, but to understand your ego and make it have less of an impact on you. And also the, the very nature of life, you know, the, the basic idea is that um, the, the gap between reality and our expectations is what makes us really frustrated. And the more we understand that in life, there's going to be setbacks, um, the less frustrated we get. And those kind of ideas really help me to be uh, more in tune with myself and with life in general, I'd say. I'm very more relaxed these days. I know about, you know, things constantly flowing so whenever th something's good it won't last forever but the same is true for any kind of crisis you know then also being able to realize that sometimes you are sort of a prisoner of your own mind like you're only capable of seeing the world from your perspective and um for your ego you are the most important thing in the world and once you get a chance to step outside yourself a little bit more and realize that that's just not the case, you know, whenever people do something to you, it's not because they're evil or um, the world's not just or, or whatever. Um, it's just, you know, people have their own agendas and sometimes um, those agendas collide, but it's really nothing personal. And when you take the, the personal element out of it and if you're just optimistic that, two weeks from now um things are going to be okay again it makes you be more you know just relaxed as a person i guess in general yeah definitely so you're talking about some concepts of mindfulness there where the the concept is one of um um becoming a, an observer um of what's going on and uh being accepting of whatever is in the present moment um so Eckhart Tolle so was that the power of now is that what you read exactly that one yeah yeah his powerful book um so tell <laughs> us paint a bit of a picture for us then you've told us that you had that defining moment and it was that movie and that you stepped into these mindfulness concepts and understanding um the place of the ego and and that things are temporary that we live in a dynamic world and which is fantastic because everything passes. So good, good stuff passes, but so is bad stuff. So that's good to know. So just tell us how you used to operate before these concepts. Like what were your beliefs about the world before you had um, this fundamental shift? Um, oh, that's hard to describe. I guess I was a bit... Um pessimistic almost very cynical like i didn't have the the most positive um take on on things like i said before um i thought i took a lot of things that happened to me very personally and whenever i was in a crisis i didn't really see a way out of it like that uh, concept of fluidity of constant change that helps me so much these days that was not available to me back then. Like whenever a coach didn't like me, I didn't, or what I perceived as not liking me. That's the first thing. Like I would never say anything like that anymore again. But back, back in the day, I was just convinced that he just favored other players and this would be the end for me at a certain club. And, you know, I was sort of going week to week in terms of my emotions. Like one week I'd be playing and we'd be winning and I was on top of the world. And the next, um, Next time I wouldn't maybe not be in the squad or 
had a terrible game, got hammered in the press, whatever, those kind of things. And it, it always, um, it really hit me. Like, uh, I guess I, I was a big target. Like, I allowed myself to be a, a big target because I think whatever happens around you now, um, if you're not a target, it can't hurt you. And the bigger your ego is, the bigger a target you present for whatever is happening in the world. And back in the day, I was one of the biggest targets you'd ever come across. <laughs> I feel like that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh dear! So you reduced your your bullseye point down somewhat now. Well, I hope so. It's it's constant work. Like whenever bad stuff happens, you know, our fir first instinct is still to react to it. But um, because of those teachings, I guess, and and those concepts. Um, you have a chance of, you call it, observing yourself. Like you can actually realize how you're reacting to certain things. So whenever criticism comes my way, and especially with the TV show now, this is bound to happen. You know, the internet is, is not a nice place, let's face it. So for nine people that actually like the show, there's always going to be one um, who's, who's going to try to take the piss or hammer the show for whatever reasons. And um, the, this minority is quite loud as well. You know, those people that actually like it, they're not commenting all the time. And uh, it's, it's mainly uh, the internet trolls that are very um, present. You know, they, they're out there. And even though they're a small number, they're very noisy. So your first reaction to that is, oh, yeah, geez. Well, it, it hurts, you know, whenever something... Um, Someone tells you that your show sucks or whatever, but then you have a chance of processing all this information that is just uh, one person's opinion, um, that um, it's your own ego that's being targeted in this moment. So like nothing really bad happened in that moment. It's just one person's opinion that should not affect my life. And the more you um, see the bigger picture of it all, the more you... Uh, able to step away from your ego, um, the easier it is to handle all these things. I guess that's the, the main idea about it all. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? How you can just turn in one direction. The, the trolls comments will still be there, but if you choose to look over here rather than over there, two completely different feelings, two completely different ways of responding. And it just, and you talked about processing it, you know, the, you see the the comment and then your ego immediately takes that, that hit and then you talk about processing um, th those comments. Is, have you got a process for the processing or how do you go about doing that? Um, first thing is not to react because what we tend to do uh, instinctively is something comes our way and we judge it and we, we want to react. We want to you know, respond to what they're saying or we feel the need to talk to someone and tell them how rubbish this person is or whatever it might be. And sometimes all it takes is just to do nothing and, you know, sit still for a few hours or have a good night's sleep and, and the next day, whatever it is, it doesn't feel that bad anymore because we realize that's not going to be the end of the world. It's just, I don't know, whatever it is inside us that, always thinks, oh, this is a threat and I have to deal with this. Because most of the time, if you just do nothing and allow yourself to do nothing, things will be fine in no time. It might take a few hours, it might take a day or two, but it hardly lasts longer than, you know, two or three days. I can't remember the last time I felt something was threatening me or was really bad. And then two, two weeks later, I, I felt the same way. It just doesn't work like that. It's that immediate feeling. And if you teach yourself uh, to be um, non-reactive, um, that's quite something already, I'd say. It is. It is indeed. And I'm really intrigued from that moment where you saw the movie that we talked about, the Eckhart Tolle movie. Um, what happened from that point? Because it's, it's good to say don't be reactive and just stop. And uh, definitely stopping and, and silence is very powerful. Um, and stopping is, is amazing stillness. So what happened to you? You saw the movie and then what did you do to start 
creating this um, and fostering and, and, and um, nurturing these, these insights that you had? Well, I got his book and I studied the book. I think um, when I finished reading it, I started it all over straight again. And I must have read the book, I don't know, five, six times now, because it, it feels like almost like studying. Like it's, it's very intriguing to hear these ideas for the first time, but it's not going to, it's not a magical transformation that happens. I think you have to almost train yourself to think a certain way because we've been programmed to think a certain way for years and years and years. And that's deeply ingrained into us and our instincts and intuitions um, lead us one way. And then there comes this guy with his ideas and tells you, well, hang on, you actually have a choice, but then you have to, um, I guess, truly understand the concepts and uh, teach yourself on, on an everyday uh, basis to, to understand what he's really saying and to put it into place. Like, like any other kind of learning, it's all about repetition, I'd say. So what was really important for me is to, to repeat these ideas all over because to be quite frank with you, the way I was leading um, my life before it didn't work out in terms of um, making me happy. I was successful to a certain extent, but I wasn't the happiest of people, you know? And then this guy comes along and all, all of a sudden there was this uh, pathway to happiness. So I just took a leap of faith and said, hey, why not try this approach? So I didn't question it all. I actually tried to understand what he was talking about. And the deeper I got into it, um, the happier it made me. And that obviously um, helps you to, to trust this guy even further. And um, that's what I've been doing ever since, I guess, to really understand the teachings and not just his, uh, there's many, many authors and ancient wisdom out there. We're talking about Buddhism and uh, Taoism and even some of the, the ideas, uh, guys like uh, Tony Robbins, you know, um, your motivation gurus, they touch on those subjects as well. It's all very closely um, related, I'd say. And I've just read book after book and uh, tried to to apply it in, in real life, I guess. So, yeah, definitely. You're um, what I call some, a proponent of personal development. Like you, you're really avid at, um, at pursuing this, um, this interest about, you know, yourself. Um, and, and it does, and you hit on this point about happiness, um, so you can be successful without necessarily being that happy. And some people, are, I think in Western society, we're so wound up and trying to strive to be someone or be seen or be important or whatever success means to us. Um, we kind of lose the moment. And I think that's what Eckhart Tolle is, is about. It's, it's about. It's about now, folks. You know, it's not about happiness isn't out there somewhere. It's here. It's, you're doing it now. <laughs> Wake up. You know, and he talks about waking up. I'm really keen to hear about your other books. So tell me your top three. So obviously, um, Power of Now is your first, is your, your top one. What are the other two that you would recommend to people if you had to pick your top three? Um, I like a book called uh, Trying Not to Try. <laughs> yeah. It's about three different um, ancient Chinese concepts. It talks about Confucius. It uh, talks about uh, Taoism. And um, another school of thought that's sort of in the middle, and they're trying to explore the concept of you know just going with the flow, and as opposed to being very disciplined, because the approaches are quite um, opposite, but the end goal is the same: to be um, a very spontaneous person, basically, and to rid yourself of fears and um, expectations, and to to be in tune with life and uh, this book is exploring different ideas and concepts and I found that really really intriguing because as we all know like just the title itself sometimes the harder you try the harder it gets and like it's such a mystery that I, I never sought to um, explore and when I came across those books 
for the first time in my life, I was actually thinking about all those things that happen in life every day. Like the harder I trained at times, the, the more I wanted to prove to everyone that I needed to be in the team, uh, the worse I, I got as a player. So why is that? What's happening inside us? And what's the answer to that? And that's a great book to, to actually be a lot more relaxed and achieving better outcomes. Oh, that's a great one. I haven't actually read that one, trying not to try, but I have to put it on my list. But I love the concepts of just being open to just being, you know, just being, because it's the, at which is a mindful state when you're just being. But also you talked about, and this is, this is something that um, I touch on when I'm setting goals with athletes, because when you do get really needy around a goal, like needing to be on the team, needing to be seen by the coach, needing all that stuff, you distance yourself from your objective because you're instantly setting up resistance. And when you set up resistance, your muscles don't work like they should. You know, you've got that, that, that body that's, that's part of this whole conundrum, you know, connected to the mind and they work together. And unless you get out of the neediness for it, you're already sort of self-defeated. So this, this is a great book by the sounds of it to help um, people understand that concept. Um, your other book, what, what else have you got there from your third one? Well, there's two more people that I want to mention touching on that. Uh, I think uh, Bruce Lee mm -hmm. is another great example because what you just said about, you know, being needy and your thoughts basically getting in your own way. Bruce Lee is very big on, on that. Like he talks about something that he calls beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. The overall idea is that you start out knowing nothing. When you're in a fight, you just fight intuitively. Like you know no techniques, you have no prior, prior experience, you just fight. And then you're getting taught all these techniques and you're putting expectations uh, on yourself. And all of a sudden, you're not just fighting anymore. You're fighting and thinking a lot. Like I should be using this technique and oh, why am I not better already? And this is luggage. Like this weighs you down in a fight, big, big time. And his idea, his concept of mastery is that you get to a point where you know all these techniques, you've executed them um, thousands of times, but then you sort of forget about them again. You go back into that state of the beginner's mind. And I really like this idea because it that's how I felt when I played football. Um, at my best, I'd say, when I was out there not thinking, just being spontaneous, um, not having any expectations, just pure joy and being sort of just responsive to what's going on, like not having a premeditated plan. It's not like, oh, I'm going to take the ball down and then I'm going to take on this player and sort of think three steps ahead already. It's more of a way of just, um, you know, again, being in the moment and reacting to what's right in front of you, and you're not reacting by thinking, it's, it just comes out of you naturally. And to get to this point, you have to practice a lot, obviously skills and all that, but also you have to um, train your mind basically not to think. And that's, that's a very good concept in life in general, because we're, we're talking about happiness. Um, when you don't think, you're not going to be unhappy. It's as simple as that because life's basically good. Every instance that we live and breathe, life's good. And it's only thoughts that sort of um, make us aware of things that are bad. Yeah, exactly. I think um, before, I mean, the language center of the brain was the last thing in evolution. I'm just thinking maybe they would have just been better just leaving that bit out, you know? <laughs> leave I it guess. Up. <laughs> I don't know if that's evolution. <laughs> dogs are a living proof of that. Right, my dogs are very zen. I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a, you, you, you've, you've hit something on. Well, it's the ultimate um, mindfulness state. Is what you're talking about? Peak performance is. It's that alpha brainwave state, which is what meditation and mindfulness create. It's interesting too. I was, I'll be interested to ask you about this because, and we've had, we've had many conversations um, about this. With, about I call it mental fitness when I'm, I'm talking with athletes, but. You know, it really is a key. Um, it's a key skill for success in in 
sport and life, and life in particular. Yet it seems overlooked by by coaches and athletes. And there's lots of research out now there to talk about, you know, peak performance states are alpha alpha brainwave states, but it's not central. When the, the mind controls everything, why isn't it one of the central components? You know, it's a bit of a conundrum. Well, so I'm interested in what your view is of um, how would you integrate um, mindfulness and meditation practices or, or these, these Eastern practices that you're talking about in sport and in football particularly because obviously that's your, that's your sport. Well, I'd say ultimately it's your individual responsibility. Like once you're exposed to those concepts, you're the one who has to put them in place. You're the one who has to, you know, just practice. That's all it is. Like you practice anything else in, in football, you practice your mental skills. And I found that in, in football in general, I'd say, people are more and more open to these ideas. Like to give an example, Thomas Tuchel, who's now at uh, Paris, when he was a Dortmund coach, he had uh, one meditation session a week with his players. and now, even long after he, he's left the club, there's still players meditating. Like he's had that kind of impact on them. And because they're in a high stress uh, environment, um, it just helps them big time. And just from, from an, I guess, investment point of view, uh, it's crucial to be open to this because players, they earn a lot of money these days. And they cost a lot in terms of, you know, transfer fees and all that. And you sort of burn a lot of money if you have very skillful players that for whatever reasons are not capable of performing to their full potential. So I think that's what makes people realize too, hey, hang on, we have to work on the mental side of things. And what helps too is all that research that you just hinted at. Because back in the day, it was like a sort of mumbo jumbo concept talking about buddhism and all that and now we're talking about uh, concrete evidence we're talking about um, brain waves and, and stuff you know and i guess in the west it all began with uh Csikszentmihalyi, the hungarian guy mm. who looked into what he called flow yeah. like why are artists doing what they are doing um what's the feeling behind it and then uh soon after that he discovered that uh, sports people experience exactly the same it's that um, place you go to where there's no time and place there's no thoughts and now we know that all these feelings are related like being in the zone or meditating or you know experiencing that kind of flow it's that i guess ideal state of being human where we're capable of our best uh, performances and football has now realized i guess that there's tremendous potential in it. And you, did you say football has now realized that? I think so. I think that very, like a lot of clubs, a lot of coaches and players are now open to, to the idea. Like back in the day, if you told someone that you were going to meditate this afternoon, people would have rolled their eyes. But um, it's different now. It's seen as part of being a professional, I guess. So it's being more acceptable to do that now, now that there's um, evidence. Funny, isn't it, how you need scientific evidence of something that's just been around and is, the evidence is in the knowing, the evidence is in the feeling, but that's not enough evidence. We still need the science behind it. It's, it's just interesting. But it's good. It's great. So it's being um, embraced um, in many clubs um, that you find. Um, and I know, look, you know, even going back, I'm thinking about Phil Jackson, the basketball coach, and and, and he's the the um, Seattle Seahawks. Um, remember who they were, but they you know big proponents of it. So I think with with big um, clubs like that actually showing the benefits of it, it's only a matter of time before it just becomes commonplace. So. With, the, with that, I'd like to find out what your daily practice is. If you could share with us when you were, when you were playing in particular, whether it's changed um, from, I know you have a slightly different lifestyle now. <laughs> but uh, give us, if you could go back um, and tell us 
when you were actually playing, what was a typical day looking like for you? Well, I guess because of the heat in, in Brisbane, we always trained really early, which uh, for me, you know, I'm kind of a night owl. It wasn't the best thing to happen. But uh, the, the bright side of it was that uh, we were basically home by, let's say, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, if there was only one training session a day. And um, I had a, I was fortunate enough to live in a very beautiful place with a nice little pool. And what I did, not every day, that would be exaggerated, but quite a lot, I'd just uh, sit by the pool and, uh, you know, just meditate for however long, you know, sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes half an hour. And uh, especially in those days, right after I discovered the book, that was basically something I, I loved doing. I, I was doing it sometimes uh, twice a day and uh, I really saw the benefits. Um, from it these days um it has developed a little bit like what i find most relaxing and it sounds kind of stupid is uh, going for walks because i have a lot of time on my hands um in terms of i don't you know have to be somewhere at um, a specific time like i still have to do a lot of work but i can run on my own schedule so wherever i go um, I'm not, if, if possible, I'm not taking the train or taking the car. I actually walk there. Up to everything up to an hour, I guess, most of the times I'd walk there, which I find really meditative, mm. I have to say. Yeah, walking meditation. Is what they, yeah, definitely. Something uh, just powerful about it. You're being with your own thoughts, but able to process so much and your body involved as well. It's quite powerful. Um, if you think back to when you first started, because people will hear you going, yeah, sure, you sit down by the pool and meditate. Um, there are some people that mightn't understand what that means. Um, what does it mean to you, meditation, and how easy and or hard did you find it when you first started out? I think it's a, a tricky one because, again, we have expectations when we do it. Like you expect to go into this state of, you know, feeling like some Buddha-like creature. And it's actually quite the opposite. It's quite annoying because you realize that yeah. your, your brain doesn't want to shut up, basically. It's constantly talking to you. And if you're not thinking about what's going on in the world, you'll think about, oh, here I'm sitting, meditating. Oh, no, another thought. And, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, yes, I know. And it, it can be quite frustrating, but I guess that's not what it's all about. Um, it's it's more about you know slowing things down and um, observing your mind. Like to to me at least, and it's a personal experience. And some people would say I'm doing it wrong, but to me the um, the fact that I can sort of observe my own thoughts that in itself to me is meditation like those two factors that for one i'm i'm becoming calmer and calmer in the process like whenever you sit for half an hour just doing nothing you'll calm down straight away mm -hmm. same is true for for walking mm -hmm. like go go for a long walk with no one to talk to you'll be quite relaxed by the end of it mm -hmm. and the other thing is um being aware of your own thoughts and that to me is basically the, the most important thing. Because the moment I realize what's going on in my brain, I can sort of direct it. And directing your thoughts is a very powerful tool because you can direct them towards unhappiness or happiness. And the involuntary thing is directing it towards unhappiness. But if you can identify a moment where your thoughts go wrong and you can say like, oh, hang on, stupid, don't go down that path. Um, you're not fueling the fire. and you can at times actively redirect your thoughts, which I find very powerful. Yeah, it's fun times, isn't it, when you sit back and start looking at your thoughts and you go, what is that about? <laughs> Where does it, what? And then it goes over here and over there in this web of just rhetoric and ridiculousness, and it's quite entertaining. It can be, yeah, very noisy up there. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I find too that even the worst thoughts begin with a with a very small thought. Like it's almost like a bait. Like you you've been thrown a, a bait, and it's basically up to you if you want to take it. Because if you want to dread your finances or, or whatnot. It's not like straight away your brain's going to tell you uh, you're going to be broke in three weeks' time. But the thought that pops to mind is something like, oh, well, you've been dining out for the third day in a row. You know what that costs. And actually, you know, maybe you should be a bit more careful in terms of that. So here's a small thought that's basically meaningless in itself. You can just say, well, hang on, maybe you should cook at home a little bit more, right? But then your brain takes over and adds one thing um, to it and the next thing to it. And all of a sudden, you find yourself feeling that um, you're, you're on the edge of bankruptcy. And I feel that when we're able to, to stop those thoughts, when they're still very small, the, the big ones that really hit us, they have no chance to, to unfold. So you stop them before they grow. Basically, because when you realize them for what they are, like your, your brain is always trying to protect you. And that's um, part of the, the research. Um, I guess what they find out that our brain is designed to protect us. So straight away, our brain is going to tell us, oh, I'm not sure you can trust this person. Oh, don't travel to this country. It's too dangerous. Or, oh, man, you should watch your finances. You're going to be broke in no time. Whatever it might be, your brain is looking out for you simple as that but that doesn't mean that everything it tells you um is true or real like most of it is way too uh, cautious i'd say yeah. and that in itself sometimes um takes away our you know lightness of being mm -hmm. so you don't have to listen to every thought and when you the more you're capable of that ignoring thoughts the happier you're going to be yeah definitely uh, the survival brain it's um, great you know to have when you're really under threat you know if you're about to fall off a cliff or something but um for the, most, the rest of it for the most part it's a big scaredy cat and you can't really have a scaredy cat running your life and being happy and truly truly happy i don't think and successful um and we don't get taught that we don't get a user manual for the brain you know and i can't think of anything more important than, than that. Can you give me an example of um, when you uh, were a player where that thought may have grown? What, what sort of thoughts were started small and maybe before you started your practices, you were allowed to grow? I think you hinted on a few of them about, you know, people not, coaches not liking you and those type of things. Is there any, anything that comes to mind that was a persistent one? Um, yeah, I guess the one about um, a coach not liking me, that was my biggest one. And it becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, not almost, I actually did, I'd say. Most of the times I was sort of creating a reality not based on what was really in front of me, but what I wanted to happen. And that's, well, I guess we are all architecture, uh, architects of our own fate and we have to really be careful about what we we think and i've seen it especially you know when when i grew older and i was aware of some of the things that we're talking about right now i saw it in young players um you know they have a bad training session they miss the goal for a few times like it's shooting practice and um they they butcher to big chances straight away they start to you know talk to themselves Sometimes, sometimes internally, sometimes just cursing and for everyone to see. And it gets worse from that moment on. And then they take this feeling, those thoughts um, of them, you know, oh, I'm not able to hit the target, oh, I'm in bad form, whatever. They take it home, they dwell on it. And the next day they show up to training and that shooting practice still has an, an impact on them. Like that's long gone. That was yesterday. but um, it sort sort of in, influences or impacts their their confidence levels, and then straight away they have a bad week of practice, and then um, they think about you know um, what's the coach gonna think? What does that mean for my contract situation? Am I gonna be here next season? So 
the pressure is just building and building and building. And as a young player, if you are able to to realize what you're doing to yourself, you've got a huge advantage. Because all it is sometimes, you know, it's it's probability. Like you show up to training out of ten times, you're gonna be all right and perform all right for I don't know five, six, seven times, but you're bound to have a bad session. And sometimes, and that's just statistics. You're gonna have a nightmare of a training session, but that's that is the nature of life. This is going to happen. Like the best players in the world, they have shockers, they miss sitters, they have terrible games, they fail to show up in big games. Not a problem. It's how you react to it. Actually, I was watching a, a documentary yesterday, not a very good one, but there was this one guy in it, and um, he he said something really intelligent. He said. Um, we talk about control in our lives a lot. And the thing is, you don't have control over what's happening. Well, you do to a certain extent, but certainly not to everything that's happening around you. But the one thing you really do have control over is how you want to react to that. And that I find very powerful. And if you apply that to the example I just gave you, well, for whatever reasons, you're having a bad training session. But what you do have control over now is how you want to react to that. Do you want to dwell on it for two, three days and sort of fuel all your doubts and the negativity in you and the pessimist in you? You can do that, but it's going to hurt you. It's going to affect you big time. Or you learn to be aware of your own thoughts and you teach yourself to stop them. Yeah, exactly. It's how you direct your focus and what you make things mean, isn't it? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, you're talking about shockers and bad days and I, I'm interested to see, to hear what you think, um, the, the lens that you see the world through, because I often talk about that we're just in a big, it's just a big learning bubble. And if you look at it from learning, there can be no failure, there can only be learning. And that's a big difference, I think, um, with people that really excel and don't well is they look for a lesson and they ask, well, okay, so if I missed the goal, what was I focused on and what can I be focused on to get on target next time? So it's not even whether it was good or bad. It's, is, is it getting towards the outcome I want and how can I get closer to that? So it's, it's what you're making it mean for sure. And really nothing in the world has any meaning at all until we, our brain gets in the way, right? And we apply something. Yeah, I guess that's another big one, judging things. I guess all those wise guys, they teach us not to judge. Because mm. who's to know what's good or bad? Like, for instance, when my career was basically over in Germany, when I hit a dead end, was that bad? That was the reason for me to come to Australia and I've had the best and happiest years in my entire career. So. Back in the day, I would have told you, oh, the worst thing that happened to me was uh, I was basically not good enough to play in the Bundesliga. Mm -hmm. Now, the very same moment, I consider probably the best thing to happen to me in life. And it's, it's like that quite a lot, especially with setbacks. Because like you're saying, if, you, if you're being non-judgmental and you just look at what's right in front of you and you react to it again. So um, I'm not able to do this right now so rather than judging yourself and, and you know blaming yourself for not being better or whatever just find a way to get better and don't invest any negativity in it and also realize uh, you were talking about the, the learning curve mm -hmm. that this is just a, a snapshot in time well today i'm not able to do this but tomorrow might be or three weeks from now you know when i was um talking to you about the the tv show we're having like we, we started this um show from scratch so straight away we are not you know the best presenters yeah it's a learning curve like you you look at yourself and you're like oh my god i'm, I'm terrible i'm you know <laughs> i'm not charismatic um this is i'm very stiff what's wrong with me i'm, I'm not that kind of person but it's it's a normal thing like give it two or three shows you get better and you, you can see that straight away. 
and then it goes on after that like the, the more you do it um the better you get so what's the point in beating yourself up just have faith in yourself and rather than focusing on the negatives look at where you could be in, in half a year's time in a year's time in two years time and be patient like it's not like you go to the practice room and um you know you sit down for three hours talking about practicing guitar and then straight away you're gonna get better but if you constantly chip in away, it's bound to happen it's just a matter of time so be patient be positive and more than anything don't tell you yourself the entire time whilst you're practicing oh my god you suck at this why not better than, than that already it's just it sucks the life energy out of you it does and you know you hit on your um other mindfulness activity your guitar playing playing an instrument was that in instrumental in uh, helping you, uh, stay grounded too because you were playing guitar before you came to Australia is that the thing that helped you you know get, keep your equilibrium um, before you discovered things like the mindfulness and the mindfulness meditation um, yeah definitely because that's one thing like, you can't think and play guitar at the same time like all your problems they just disappear for for a while so why is that just uh escaping reality for a bit but it does certainly help whatever problems or issues you might have with your girlfriend or with your coach or whatever pick up a guitar so that goes away but what it really did to me um when i came to australia i got very serious about learning the instrument like i really wanted to become a good um guitar player i guess that's the the football in me always being sort of you know ambitious and wanting to get better so i took lessons and all that and it was slow like the progress was so slow and at the same same time i was starting to work on um, my mental growth i'd say so whilst you you cannot you know assess your mental growth it's it's hard to to say am i processing things any better than i did three weeks ago but in terms of playing guitar you can mm. so here i was practicing two things and seeing that i was making progress purely by chipping away mm. so that gave me confidence that working on all the mental stuff as well that there would be um some sort of progress mm. so it was almost like an analogy for me because you, you can't really, you know, touch anything mental, but you can assess progress you make in terms of your football or in terms of playing an instrument. Probably more than anything, playing an instrument because it's so isolated. It's just you and the instrument. You're sitting there, and you can actually say, "Well, three months back, I wasn't able to play that song. Now I am." And I guess it's the same for me, or I look at it the same way when it comes to mental and personal growth. I might not be able to do it now, but I'm certainly, I'm working on it. And sooner or later, it is going to happen. And then when you look back, how you deal with any sort of crisis or situation now and how you would have dealt with it 10 years ago, already, there's the progress. There's the big change. But sometimes when you start something new, like if you sit down, you meditate for the first time, you read those books, it feels like you're making no progress whatsoever. <laughs> and that's just not true. So rather than stopping and saying, well, it's pointless, just stick with it. Yeah, and you said something interesting. And it only has to be 10 minutes a day or even five, or I even tell my clients like three. I've, we do one minute rolling meditations. I said just every hour, just stop for one minute and just stop and breathe. That's what you need to do. You know, it doesn't have to be... You don't have to go meditate on a mountain for, you know, hours. Are you still with us, Thomas? Is it just your visual I've lost? Uh, I just, uh, I just got a, a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? <laughs> it was saying, hey. get off the interview or watch the the soccer are playing Lebanon. Don't you know that? You. <laughs> 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 oh, good. All right. Well, I'm just um, looking at the time. We're getting close to the hour. So I suppose we should head towards tying it off. I think um, 
maybe just leaving us with your three biggest tips for athletes. You've touched on um, them. You've certainly given us lots of um, thoughts. But if you had the chance to, you know, to really influence some of these young players that you, you know personally, and if you knew they were hearing and listening, what do you think the most important thing or things are that they really need to, to know and understand for them to really allow themselves to shine? Um, three things. Like the things that really made a difference to me. Um, the first one is I've become aware of what you're thinking. Like become an observer helps big time. Just that, because it it puts you in charge, gives you control. Um, the second biggest one is don't take anything personally. Like try to put your ego aside as much as you can. That's that's a really big one. And the last one is. Um, I guess it's patience. I guess with anything we do in life, um, we're putting so much pressure on ourselves. So I tell young guys it's purely to be patient because that's um, what I was lacking when I was young. And that's what I didn't want to hear from older players. But I guess it's something that's really important. I guess those three things. Yeah, I really like that last one, the patience one, because patience is when you're impatient it's the idea that it's not coming and that you need it now and then that resistance we talked about starts to to come up right um towards what you want but if, if you know it's coming you can just allow it and it seems to arrive much faster doesn't it it's leathered in yeah they're great, great tips. Thank you so much, Thomas, for spending some time with us pleasure. today. It's an absolute pleasure to see you again, I must say, and um, finding out some little tips and tricks about what you uh, you integrate into your life. And I'm very interested to see how every, how, how this is received. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of players will, will benefit from it. So thank you very much. My pleasure.